Russia in Bible prophecy. It's a subject that the Christadelphians have looked at many times. It's a subject that excites us because it shows the nearness of Christ's return. And it's a subject that is a warning to every one of us because most of the things we are going to consider tonight are going to occur after Christ has returned to this earth, I guess you'd almost say secretly or so that the general world doesn't know and has taken the believers to be with him. Yes, we'll see some of these things occur before Christ returns to take his believers, but the bulk will happen between that time and when Armageddon occurs. But the Bible has given us this information so that when these things begin to come to pass, we can be sure of the veracity of what's written in the Bible and also sure that what the Bible predicts will come to pass. You see, the end of these events will be peace on this earth, peace on God's terms, not peace on man's terms. You know, a peacekeeping force is how they bring peace, isn't it? They send the United Nations in with blue targets on their head. We know the aims of this world, and in general, in actual fact, I'd say more than in general, it's not in line with the purpose of God. And for Russia, who we're going to consider this evening, there's no difference. But what we find is that Russia will be used by God. They won't be made to do this by God. There'll be events that happen in front of them that sees this happens in accordance with what God has said. Because God knows the end from the beginning. He knows the decisions that we will make before we make them. It's something that's a little hard for us to understand. We make a decision for tomorrow and we don't really know whether we're going to do it or not, do we? You see, the purpose God has with this earth is not what Russia has intent, is intent on doing. And nor for that matter is it what the leaders of this world have intended their current dreams will be quite different to what will occur. You see, ultimately, Russia will be destroyed militarily and humbled, but not only Russia, every other nation on this earth will be in the same predicament. Our intention this evening is to look at Russia, and we'll skip over a lot of the detail in that chapter that we've had this evening so that we can consider Russia and where they will head and what will happen. You know, God has stated that he's not willing that any should perish, but there's conditions on that. He tells us that in 2 Peter 3 and verse 9. We're told the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us would, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You see, he doesn't want man to perish. He doesn't want any man to perish, but it's conditional on them coming to repentance, on them repenting and doing what God requires. You see, God desires all to be saved, but he's not just going to do it. It is going to be on God's terms and not man's terms. And I think we can be thankful for that when we look at what man does in this world. God in his word, the Bible, has stipulated how he's to be served, how he's to be worshipped, and what he would have us to do. And we know the ways of this world, Russia included, are opposed to the ways of God. You know, Russia as a nation, and I'll try and show this briefly this evening, will join with Europe to oppose God's purpose with this earth. Join with Europe, you might say? How could that happen? They're enemies as of today. Well, are they? Or how quickly we'll I'll try and show how quickly that could change they're going to try and oppose God's purpose with this earth to set up a worldwide kingdom on man's terms an event that God will not let occur you know the Bible gives us instruction on how we should live our lives to please him and there is a reward but it's not just a matter of doing what God says without reason and without proof. And God has left this for us in his word, the Bible, so that we may know the truth of what he has recorded there. 
He's left prophecies that every single one of us can understand if we're prepared to look into them. And as we said, he's not slack concerning his promise and has given ample proof of the certainty of his word. Not only has he given us this proof, he's also stated that he will reveal what he is to do to those who will listen. Amos 3, verse 7. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. And that's what we're going to look at tonight, is one of those, what's termed here, his secret. Something that's hidden that can be found if we're prepared to look. God has detailed these things. He's hidden them in his word, the Bible, so that we can look and understand what will happen on this earth so that we can have confidence that God will shortly bring that time of peace on this earth. And when we see these things occurring in the earth, things like what's happening in Ukraine today, while it is not something to be happy about, we can look at it and say, God is in control. Yes, man has made those decisions for himself that God has said he would, that will ultimately bring his purpose with the earth to pass. You know, many scoff at prophecies of the Bible. They've been doing it for years. And they will do it until the Lord Jesus Christ returns and establishes God's kingdom on this earth. And all those who will scoff will no longer be in existence. Isaiah 55 and verse 11. He says, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it will accomplish that which I please. And it will sh shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. God's word's gone forth. He said what is going to happen, and he will make sure it comes to pass. Having dealt very briefly with God's word, um, God's word and the reason for prophecy there, we're going to move on to this chapter here in Ezekiel 38. But I thought just to start with, we'd have a look at two little bits of news from today. You know, when I talk to people and say, Europe will join Russia, they laugh, they scoff, never happened. Look, they're opposed to what's going on in Ukraine. What could change that? This is today, these two bits of news. I didn't know this, but America was in for another shutdown if they didn't give them more money. But look what it says. Biden signed stopgap measure to avert shutdown. It takes them to November the 17th. Includes natural disaster aid, but not additional funding for Ukraine. Take a, I don't exactly know the full extent of that, but take away America's funding for Ukraine and they will collapse overnight. What about NATO? Today's news once again. The government led by Mr Fico and his... Um, that is, which is a NATO member of Slovakia, has joined Hungary in challenging European Union's consensus on support for Ukraine. Now, I think Hungary has said, we're not going to support you because we don't want you exporting your grain, which is cheaper than ours, into Europe. So Hungary's sort of going, we're not going to support you anymore, Ukraine. We're not giving you these things. And this man, Robert Fico, has campaigned on stopping funding for the Ukraine war, and he's won or so it would seem. And they're saying that there's another election coming where Poland might go the same way. So overnight, those things can change. The people in the region, for whatever reason, have decided that they no longer want to oppose Russia. How quickly it could change. How quickly, if America stops providing arms, Ukraine would collapse and Russia would be one step closer to what is going on. That's by the by. Let's have a look at Ezekiel 38. In the first two verses we read, And the, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and prophesy against him. The word of God here came to Ezekiel to record these things. And in this second verse here, we have Russia mentioned. We'll have a look at that in a minute. He's told to set his face against Gog, the land of Magog. Gog is a name and it means one at the top. And it refers to the one who's going to rule over these nations. 
He's going to rule over them with a rod of iron. Nations, as I said before, in many cases that today do not see eye to eye. But something is going to happen, what it is I don't know, to bring them together, either willingly or unwillingly. Well, who is Magog? Magog, um, Gesenius tells us, is a proper name of a son of Japheth. It's also a region and a great and powerful people of the same name, inhabiting the extreme recesses of the north, who are at some time to invade the Holy Land or Israel. We are to understand just the same nations as the Greeks comprised under the name of the Scythians. This is Gesenius, who is a noted historian or lexicon. Okay, so he says they inhabit the extreme recesses of the north when taken from the land of Israel. Josephus says of Magog, they inhabited so that beginning at the mountains of Taurus and Amanus, they proceeded along Asia as far as the river Don, today I won't pronounce the other one or I'll really make a mess, and along Europe to Cadiz and settling themselves on the land. Magog founded those that from him were named Magites, but who are by the Greeks called Scythians. So it's that same area up the north that we're talking about. Herodotus said the name Scythia was given by the Greeks to an ancient and widely extended people of Europe who had spread themselves from the river Tanis or Don westward along the banks of the Ister or Danube. So what we find is that Magog is that area in the, um, I guess, Central Europe there, you'd almost call it. And surprise, surprise, Ukraine's in there. We'll show why that's important in a minute. And Germany and many others. These nations are going to join with Russia. We're told also in the King James Version that he was to prophesy against the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. But we find that this is not a very good translation. And if we look at the alternative translation from the revised version, we find it says, and follow in verse 2 of Ezekiel 38 and see the subtle difference. He says, Son of man, set thy face toward Gog, the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshech and Tubal. The prince of Rosh he has here. And who is this prince of Rosh? Well, once again, we need to turn to the various historians to find out who they are. It's worth noting that it's told it is Gog, the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh. This one is to be a person who will rule over Rosh, Meshech, Tubal, and also Magog. And this person is the one who will ultimately rule over Central Europe or all those nations there. Well, what are we told about Rosh? Who is Rosh? It's credible that from Rosh and Meshech, that is the Roshi and the Moshki, of whom Ezekiel speaks, descended the Russians and the Moscovites, nations of the greatest celebrity in European Scythia. So we're told that Rosh is the Russians. A Russian historian, he says, after the deluge, and we'll skip that down to the bit that is highlighted, these lands contain numerous tribes such as Rus. He says our land was called Rus. We have learned about it from Greek chronicles by Georgius, where he mentions Rus raids on Constantinople. And this is a Russian historian, Rus or Russia. Uh, Russia. Rosh. Gesenius tells us, is a northern nation mentioned by, with Tubal and Meshech, undoubtedly the Russians. These are not Christadelphians. These are people who've looked at the scriptures, who've looked at, in this case, the Bible, but in other cases, history, to put together those points to show that Rosh here is the Russians. They inhabit this land up here. We know that, don't we? Well, who else is with them? We have Meshech. Meshech, the proper name Moshki, a barbarous people inhabiting the Moshkin mountains between Iberia, Armenia and so forth. Lucenius tells us. Easton's Bible Dictionary says that 
They were in all probability the Moschke or people inhabiting in the Moschean mountains between the Black and the Caspian Sea. Mingling with the Scythians, they became known as Moscovs and gave the name to the Russian nation and its ancient capital, today known, I will say, as Moscow. So it's this area up around Moscow that it's talking about. So you can see the nations there being built that Russia has control over. Tubal, a proper, na proper name, the Tiberinii, a nation of Asia Minor dwelling by the Exine Sea to the west of Moschi or Moscow. And that is where Tubal is. Today we know those nations, don't we? Rosh, Meshach, Tubal make part of Russia. They're all under that one banner. We told in verse 3 to 4 that he was to prophesy against these people. And verse 3 says, And say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and I'll turn thee back and put hooks in thy jaws, and I'll bring thee forth all thine army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armour, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords." We're told here that they're to have hooks put in their jaws. They'll be drawn forth. There'll be something that entices this host of nations to turn back and come against the people of Israel, to come down into the Middle East. They will, it would appear, almost need to be dragged there against their will because I guess if you've got a hook put in your jaw, you're having to do something that's a little against your will. But what form that hook will take, we do not know. It might be something that entices them that's in that region, oil, gold, technology, I don't know. You know, we've seen Russia move recently over many nations. There's Georgia, um, there was Crimea, there's Ukraine. Do they need a reason? Putin dreams it up and off he goes. What he might, where he might go next is anybody's story. They're talking about the possibility of him going into the, some of those nations right up in the north, Norway and the one next to it, Latvia, not Latvia. You know the ones I mean, the ones right up the north there. And there's concern about that. What would his pretext be? Well, who knows? In verse 4, we're told that Russia will be turned back. And we can see the meaning of this word. They'll be dragged down. And in verse 5 to 6, we told Persia, Ethiopia and Libya with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all his bands, the house of Tagama of the north quarters and all his bands and many people with thee. Persia, Ethiopia and Libya. Persia, the area of Iran and Iraq. Libya, we know where that is. And Ethiopia, most likely down um, or where Ethiopia is today. If you've been following the news, you would have heard of a mercenary they had. I forget his plane mysteriously fell out of the sky a few, a few weeks ago. But those mercenaries have been very active through this area of Africa. And now he's gone, guess who controls Mr Putin? They're singing to his tunes. Nations that were pro-French are now... Pro-Russian. Ethiopia, uh, Libya, definitely pro-Russian, despite what's going on there. Iran and Iraq, well, they don't have much um, love for the West, do they? Or Togama, the area of northern Armenia or northern Turkey. The Turks aren't making themselves very popular with the Russians at the moment. In verse 7, we're told that thou were to be prepared and to prepare thyself, thou and all thy company that is assembled unto thee, and be thou a guard unto them. You know, that word assembly there has religious ideas. And even if in this case it relates to false religion, it will be on religious grounds that this invasion occurs. All of the churches that will be involved in this conflict claim Jerusalem as a holy city the Roman Catholic Church, the Russian Orthodox Church, the Muslims, the Western nations, who'll be there as well. 
Paul see Jerusalem as a holy city. And they'll come down there and it will be a holy war. But it will be God who intervenes because their holy war is not based on the truth of God. You know, it's interesting that Ukraine's been turned into a holy war. If you listen to what's going on, if you get killed in Ukraine and you're a Russian, you get a fast ticket to heaven. That's what they tell their people. Nothing could be further from the truth. We're told that Gog, the one that leads these nations, who we also believe will be the autocrat of Russia, will be a guard unto all these nations. They'll be one, he'll be one that will hedge about. He will guard or protect those nations that are with him. He'll make sure they don't go. And those nations that Russia has gone into recently or over the years, I'm sure that's the way they feel in Georgia, in Crimea, in Syria. The Russians are not going very fast anytime soon. He will be a guard unto them. And the word has the idea of guarding as one would guard a prisoner. And no doubt that's the way those nations feel. They can see no way out from what's happened to them. It's interesting to note that in Western times, in, in recent times, the Western nations have started to worry about the autocratic tendencies of Mr. Putin. Back in 2006, I remember seeing an article in the West Australian that said exactly that. And the world brushed it off. But maybe they should have been a little more concerned than they were. You know, could Mr Putin be that autocrat? We don't know. But he's definitely trying. And if it's not him, well, the one that follows isn't going to be a very pleasant person. In verse 8, we're told that after many days thou shalt be visited. In the latter years thou shalt come into the land that was brought back from the sword. And he's gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel, which have always been waste. But it is brought back out of the nations, uh, back out of the nations, and they shall dwell safely, all of them. We're told that this Russian host will come down into the land of Israel that is brought back from the sword. A land that has a population of people that's come out of many countries. It's now located on the mountains of Israel. And obviously this refers to the Jews who now inhabit that land of Israel. And Russia and these nations will come against them. Not only Russia and those nations, but ultimately every nation of the earth. Because they'll be opposed by what we would today term the Western nations. They will come against a nation that has neither bars nor gates. But we find they'll come against a nation that has neither bars nor gates. The nation of Israel. A nation that dwells safely. A nation that dwells confidently. They think they can look after themselves. But at this time it won't happen. In verse 9 to 12, we're told, Thou shalt ascend and come like a storm. Thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land. Thou and all thy bands and many people with thee. Thus saith the Lord God, It shall come to pass at that same time, Shall things come into thy mind, and thou shalt think an evil thought. And thou wilt say, I'll go to the land of unwalled villages. I'll go to them that are rest, that dwell safely. All of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates. To take a spoil and to take a prey. To turn thine hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited. And upon the people that are gathered out of the nations, which have gotten cattle and goods that dwell in the midst of the land. They'll go to a land that's brought back from the sword, a land that is populated from people brought out of many countries, and certainly that is the case with the Jews in the land of Israel. They've been brought back from every nation of the world and returned to the land of Israel, to the land of Israel, but it continues to be the subject of much bloodshed today. And it will continue to be until the Lord Jesus Christ returns to the earth and establishes the kingdom of God in Jerusalem. This confederacy of nations led by Russia will come with great numbers 
We told it'll be like a cloud to cover the land. And they will come forth with the intent of taking a spoil and taking a prey from a land, from a people that dwells securely. They dwell thinking that they are safe by their own hand because the people of Israel have forgotten Almighty God. They say, we can do it ourselves, but they will be humbled so they turn to Almighty God. But that's a, da- a subject for another night. You know, these events are not only spoken of here in Ezekiel 38, but they're spoken of in other parts of Scripture as well. Daniel 11 is another case in point. In verse 41, it talks about the same thing. He that is Russia, or that host of nations led by Russia, shall enter also into the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown. But these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom and Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon. We told many countries shall be overthrown. He'll come down into the glorious land, the land of Israel. But they, we also told there that Edom and Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon will escape. And today, that refers to the land of Jordan. And what it would appear would happen is Russia will come down through Israel and it will initially head south into Egypt and then it will come back up to Israel. But those nations, Edom and Moab, or Jordan as we have today, will escape. In verse 42 and 43, he says, He shall stretch forth his hand upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. But he shall have power over the treasures of gold and of silver and all the precious things of Egypt. And the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his step. You remember we had the Libyans and the Ethiopians in Ezekiel 38 as well. So he's going to come down through Israel and into Egypt, and the Egyptians shall not escape. He'll have power over their treasures and those other nations will be at his step. You know, elsewhere it talks about Egypt being under the control of a cruel lord. And if Mr Putin is to be that man, doesn't he fit the bill? You cross him and see what happens. Egypt will feel the wrath of that invading force led by Russia. But they won't have it all their own way. Well, there'll be a token resistance. If you've still got your Bible open there in Ezekiel 38 and verse 13, we told that Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish with all the young lions thereof shall say, Art thou come to take a spoil? Hast thou gathered thy company to take a prey, to carry away silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods, to take a great spoil? It very much sounds like a token resistance, doesn't it? And what we have here is those nations that will oppose Russia. We have Tarshish or Britain. We also have Tarshish on the other side, which is India. And that's interesting because India at the moment and Russia are a little bit like this. Things will have to change. We have Sheba and Dedan down here, the area of Saudi Arabia. We also have the Young Lions, which Canada, Australia, New Zealand. Most likely I would suggest the United States as well. They will oppose. They will say, you come to take a spoil? Are you come to take a prey? But their opposition will only do one thing. It will infuriate those nations. And they'll go forth with great fury and they will overthrow those nations. They will destroy them militarily. As Daniel 11 verse 44 shows, and I think we'll look at that in a minute. In verses 14 to 17, we're told... Of Ezekiel 38, son of man, prophesy and say unto Gog, thus saith the Lord God, in that day when my people of Israel dwelleth safely, shalt thou not know it? And thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts, thou and many people with thee, all of them riding upon horses, a great company and a mighty army. Where's the north parts from Israel? Rosh, Meshach and Tubal. What we know today as Russia In verse 16, And thou shalt come up against my people Israel as a cloud to cover the land. It shall be in the latter days, and I will bring thee against my land, that the heathen may know thee when I shall be sanctified in thee, O Gog, before their eyes. Thus saith the Lord God, Art thou he of whom I have spoken in old time by my servant the prophets of Israel, which prophesied in these days many years, 
that I would bring thee against them. They come out of the north parts, and Russia will come against the people of Israel when they dwell safely or confidently, with confidence and securely, as the word means. This one will come out of the north quarters in sufficient numbers, we're told, to cover the land. While in verse 16, we see that God will be sanctified in Gog. At the end of the verse there, when I shall be sanctified in thee, O Gog, before their eyes. And we'll see how that happens in a minute. This one will come. And in, in Daniel 11, verse 44, we have the similar thing again. We're told that, remember in Daniel, they'd gone down into Egypt. And what we're told is tidings out of the north and out of, sorry, out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. It'll trouble that host. There's something going on to the east and to the north. He shall go forth with great fury to destroy and to utterly make away many. And up in those regions, there'll be two things happening. One will be that token resistance from Tarshish and the young lions and Sheba and Dedan. And he'll go forth with great fury and destroy. But the other will be something he cannot overcome. It will be Christ and the saints. We'll look at that very briefly. You see, when viewed from Egypt, where Russia will be, tidings will come in two directions. Those, as I said, <coughs> which are those nations that oppose Russia. But there'll also be an army of mighty ones who will go forth and fight on God's behalf. Not that they need to fight. This will be an army of immortal beings. And that's what we are all called to be, is part of those immortal beings that are there. It'll be the Lord Jesus Christ with the immortal believers. And this can be you and me. And these will be the ones who destroy the Russian host in Egypt first. And by doing this, the defeated Egyptian nation will realise that it was the intervention of a power more mighty than anything they could put forward or man could put forward. And the Egyptians will accept the Lord Jesus Christ, who will be the king of the Jews. The Egyptians will turn to God, the true God, the God of the Jews, and will worship him. But these will initially be ignored by Russia as they see the opposition of the Western powers in the North Massey. It'll be Tarshish and the Young Lions, Britain and the Commonwealth of Nations. But we're told that he will go forth and utterly make away many. In verse 18 to 23 of Ezekiel, we're told, And it will come to pass at that same time when Gog shall come into the land of Israel, saith the Lord God, that my fury shall come up in my face. God's fury will come up in his face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spo spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel, so that the fishes of the sea and the fowls of the heaven and the beasts of the field and all creeping things that creep upon the earth and all the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. And the mountains shall be thrown down and the steep places shall fall and every wall shall fall to the ground. And I'll call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains, saith the Lord God. Every man's sword shall be against his brother. And I'll plead against him with pestilence and with blood. And I'll rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the many people that are with him an overflowing rain and great hailstones, fire and brimstone. The ultimate outcome. Verse 23. Thus will I magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know that I am the Lord. We're told that God's fury will come up in his face as he sees this nation come against his people. As he sees this nation say, I will establish my kingdom in opposition to what God requires. And we're told there'll be a very great shaking in the land of such a magnitude that we're told that every wall will fall to the ground. But interestingly enough, we're told that God will cause the swords or the weapons of every member of that invading force to be against his brother so that it commences to destroy himself. You remember the story of Gideon, the young ones here, with that dream and the rock falling down and knocking it over. 
And I like to think, maybe it's not quite like this, of someone escaping out of Europe, out of Egypt, petrified and going back and saying what's gone on, and that going through the camp of the Russians. And when those saints come, they turn on themselves and destroy themselves because that's what God said would occur. In Zechariah 14, verse 12 to 13, we're told, And this shall be the plague, wherewith the Lord will smite all the people that are fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet, and their eyes shall consume away in their holes, and their tongue shall consume away in their mouth. Fire and brimstone rained upon them. And it shall come to pass in that day that a great tumult from the Lord shall be among them. And they shall lay hold every one on the hand of his neighbour, and his hand shall rise up against the hand of his neighbour. You see, those forces that are there are going to turn on themselves. They're going to destroy themselves. Something is going to make them absolutely petrified, absolutely not knowing who is their enemy. In Daniel 11, verse 45, we're told that he shall plant the tabernacles of his palaces between the sea and the glorious mountain. Yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. He's going to come into the land of Israel. He's going to set himself up there. And we're told that none will come, he will come to his end and none will help him. And who would help him? You see, he'll be defeated by that stone cut out of the mountain without hands, that one we have in Daniel chapter 2. Russia and her allies will be destroyed upon the mountains of Israel. Militarily, they will be no more. It won't be by the military might of man. It won't be America or Britain or Australia destroying them. It will be the Lord Jesus Christ and that immortalised army that is with him that moves north from Sinai to answer the anguish cry that comes from that land, to destroy that cruel Lord that has come against them. It will be the immortal saints who come with the Lord Jesus Christ who execute the judgments of God. But God will also use the natural elements to see that none of them escape. Hailstones, fire and brimstone, as we read before. The king of the north, Russia, Gog and those with him, will come to the end, their end and none will help them. There will be none that are able to resist this divine judgment that comes on these nations. This massively powerful force, as far as man is concerned, will be broken without human hands. You know, when, he, when, Russia, when Christ and the saints, the immortal believers, who, as they will be at that time, Come against Russia. That is the battle of Armageddon. And the beginning of the end of the dominion, the domination of man over the earth and the commencement of the establishment of the kingdom of God on the earth. In verses 1 to 5 of Ezekiel 39, we're going to have a very quick look at that. We have the destruction of this host, Russia included, outlined. They'll be slain on the mountains of Israel and be prey for the ravenous birds, we're told. It describes the nations who come with Russia as being totally decimated. And later in the chapter, which we won't look at, it talks about a tomb being erected to commemorate their destruction, to commemorate what happens to those who oppose Almighty God. Those who defy Almighty God and what he will have with this earth. He commences and says, Therefore, son of man, prophesy against Gog and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. It's reiterating to us who he's talking about. Those same ones as in Ezekiel 38. In verse 2, he says, I'll turn thee back and leave but the sixth part of thee, and I'll cause thee to come up from the north parts and will bring thee upon the mountains of Israel. They'll be turned back, as we had in verse 4 of the previous chapter. The judgments of God in these nations is stated as seeing a sixth part left. But the actual meaning of this is that there will be very few, if any, left. They'll be brought to the mountains of Israel, and there God will fight against them. 
In reality, it will be their total destruction. There will be few, if any, that remain. They will be destroyed to such an extent that they are incapable of rising again to fight for another day. In verse 3, we're told, And I will smite thy bow out of thy left hand, and will cause thine arrows to fall out of thy right hand. You know, it has the idea of whatever they do not working. Their weapons will be useless, and they will fall to a violent death. They will desert. They will fall away. They will fall into the hand of the Almighty God. You know, there's no escape from that. Those who are there will be completely overthrown, being subject to divine judgment. But the nations will remain. Russia as a nation will still be there. Australia as a nation, who will be there fighting as well against them, will still be here. And they will be given the opportunity of submitting to the Lord Jesus Christ and to his ways, or having the judgments of God upon them. In verse 4, we're told, Thou shalt fall upon the mountains of Israel, thou and all thy bands, and, thy, and the people with thee. And I will give thee unto the ravenous birds of every sort, and to the beasts of the field, to be devoured. You know, while I'm sure that the ravenous birds are going to have a field day, and the wild animals are going to have a very good feed, it has a greater meaning than this. Let's just have a look in Isaiah 46 and verse 11 to illustrate this. And here we have the calling of a ravenous bird from the east, the man that executeth my counsel from the far country. Yea, I have spoken it. I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it. I will also do it. And what we have here is a ravenous bird from the east described as that man who is come to execute the counsel of God from a far country. And that ravenous bird... In this case, in um, Isaiah 11, was a man who does the will of God. And in Ezekiel 39, it has a similar meaning. It's related to Christ and to those who will be with him, who will execute the judgments of God on those nations. It's related to Christ and those who will come and do The judgment and, and bring the judgments of God on those nations. And the beasts or the living creatures that the word means has the same idea of those who will come and overthrow those nations. They will destroy them, they will humble them. And militarily they will be no more. You know, I have no doubt that they will come against those nations like a ravenous bird or animal will. For the simple reason they oppose the Almighty God. They will make sure there is no none to rise again to oppose him out of that battle. Their intent will be destroying those who challenge the God of heaven and earth so that the kingdom of God can be established on this earth. Those nations will be destroyed without the help of mortal man and none, we are told, will help them. And the confusion that will occur in their ranks will be such that their weapons will be turned on each other and will cause total destruction. Back in Psalm 149, verse 7, we're told who will execute this judgment. We're told to execute vengeance upon the heathen and punishments upon the people, to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron. This is what's going to happen to those ones that come. To execute the judgments written, this honour hath all his sons. Praise ye the Lord. You see, what that's telling us is those judgments that are going to happen. It's going to be the honour of his sons. The honour of those who understand the things of Almighty God today. The honour of those who are there with Christ. Why? Because they like the destruction? No, not at all. Because they know that while the ways of man are on this earth, there can be no peace. And they know that by executing those judgments, the kingdom of God can be established on this earth. And they, those Christ and the saints will go forth and execute those judgments. And it will be an honour for them to do so. 
because they will see the ultimate end when God will be all in all. In verse 5 of Ezekiel 39, we told, Thou shalt fall upon the open field. Why? For I have spoken it, saith the Lord God. There'll be no reprieve for that force. They can surrender or submit, but they will be destroyed and fall in the open field. And what we're told here indicates they will not submit, but will be destroyed. You see, these nations will be humbled. Militarily, they'll be destroyed. There'll be that great earthquake that destroys the infrastructure of man. But they will then, those that remain, those in the nations, back in their home, I guess to put it that way, will be given the opportunity of submitting to Christ. Some people will. Some won't. And it'll be the responsibility of the saints, those spoken of there who have executed the judgments of God, to go forth and to give them the opportunity of understanding the things of Almighty God, of submitting to the way of God. Or they will feel once again the judgments of God upon them. You know, I mentioned at the start that most of this will happen when Christ returns, when he's taken the saints out of the earth. It will be a time of trouble, we're told, such as never was. It will be a fearful time on this earth because it will be the whole world that is affected, much more than we have today. But what the Bible tells us is that you have the opportunity to be shielded from these things. You have the opportunity to be one of those saints one of those saints who understands the purpose of Almighty God and is prepared to go forth and execute his judgments. The alternative is to be one of those who has God's judgments brought upon him. Or if they're fortunate to survive the Battle of Armageddon and the earthquake that will happen and all those other things and respond to the preaching of God. You see, God requires man to submit to him. He's given what he would have them to do today so that when these things come to pass, they will be spared this time of trouble that will come on the earth. Ladies and gents, these things will come to pass. And you can either position yourselves to be with Christ and the saints as part of the saints or you can remain in this world, to be without hope in this world, to see these events come and to be impacted by them. You know, we encourage you to understand the scriptures so that you might be able to look at the events that are occurring in the world and see them as events that herald your redemption, that herald that time when Christ will return to establish his kingdom on this earth. We thank you for your time this evening. And we urge you to take the opportunity while there is still time to increase your knowledge and understanding of the things of God that we all might attain to that promise that is left for those who are wise, that we all might be, have the honour of executing the judgments of God on this earth and ultimately educating those who remain on this earth at that time of the ways of Almighty God. We thank you for your time.